You got me? There you go. Okay, well, once again, at least this week, we did not have a blowout. Last week was exciting. Today, I am expecting the Lord to show up just like he did last week. Only we're doing it without a blowout. Thank you, Jesus. No blowout. This week I just got lost instead. <laughs> you got lost in downtown Fort Worth because 30, the exit to 30, there was an 18-wheeler accident. And so he took the wrong road and then took a different wrong road and then took a different wrong road. But And yet, he still made it here. God was on every road. God was on every road. What a surprise. What a surprise. God was on every road. And no matter where I was at, I was directly above the center of the earth at all times. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He's so funny. Um, today's, I said I didn't need a paper, but I was kidding. What is today's quote? Today's quote is, tell us. That's right. Once we know the truth, we can't help but share it. And we are going to sing praises to the truth to the one who is called truth that is Jesus Christ and his father and we get a chance to there's a song that I really like to listen to it's by Brandon Lake and it's called Gratitude and he says what do you give to someone who has everything what do you, what do you offer what are you going to offer to the king and so um, the song is about gratitude that we have an understanding of where we have been delivered from we all have a before Jesus no matter where you are in your walk in Christ, there is always a story with the before Jesus of what Jesus has done for us and how he has redeemed us and how he has saved us and how he has adopted us and how he has changed us. And so today as we as we praise him, I want you to just in the back of your mind to think about the words that you're singing. We're singing before and to the creator of the universe who gives us the breath that we use to sing, who gave us the ability to get up this morning, who gives us the ability to look at life as either a junk hole or an opportunity. So, um, by the way, the answer to that is opportunity. <laughs> um, before I forget, um, do you have a guitar cover? Yes, ma'am. Did you already ask him? Yes. We carried it for weeks and I kept missing you because you didn't even know I had it, but I had a guitar cover for you. But we've, we've been having some hard time. It's, it's hard for us to get out here sometimes. That's all right. That's way okay. That's not why I was asking. I just was asking. I did not bring it this week, but if you needed it, I was going to bring it next week. Anyway, yes, you know, commercial. That's what I'm ADHD. Come on, Jesus. He's like that with me. He likes for me to bounce all over the page because we catch everything that way. All right, guys, let's get started. I'm really excited about what the Lord has to say today. I know I say that every week, but I mean it this week more than I mean it last week. And next week, I'll probably mean it more than that. Anyways. <laughs> we just praise you and thank you for today because it is a beautiful glorious day because we're standing here in your sight we've gathered together in your name we've come together as a tribe we've come together as a portion of the bride of christ we've come together as a family we're a community i thank you that you've called us to be a community thank you. and i thank you for the opportunity that we get to worship you it says that when we worship you it's a fragrant offering in the throne room may it be like the the incense of the prayers of the saints may it put a smile on your face and we just are delighted to recognize you for who you are and what you've done for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, y'all stand up and worship.
this where I'm going to stop in between these, but we're also trying to fix this so I can get here on time, too. <laughs> you give me a little more volume right here, please?
People said? Yes. Yes. yes! yes, that's right. <laughs> Turn back, I know you are dear. City on the Hill is a historic song for this ministry. It is. Because when, I, years ago we started. when I met Mary <laughs> 16 years ago, 17 or 18. 17 or 18, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. 
I said, whatever. <laughs> See, her ministry was called The Light. And this was their theme song then. <laughs> you are the light of the world. City on the hill cannot be hidden. Shine your light before all men. They not see your works in. Raise your father in heaven. City on the hill cannot be hidden. Stand your light before all men. Show the things that it's been given. Everything that it's been given. for today. I thank you that not only does the word, the written word exist because the son, your word, came and lived on this earth, but your word is going to be spoken today. I ask that you would make words come out of my mouth that come straight from the throne room that represent what you want to say today to all of us that are here. Like Dan Muller says, if we were to give you a mic, Father, that's what we want to hear. Speak to us today. We want to open your word. We want to read the written word, but we want to hear from the word who gave us life. We want our hearts changed. 
We want our minds changed. We want our lives just wrecked for you so that we are transformed from being an orphan to a son and a daughter and that we're changed. Thank you, Father, for what you are doing in our community. So speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So when Darren asked me for a, a, he said, do you have a quote today or do you want me to pick one? And I said, "Mm, I don't know. So I just, you know, prayed about it. And he actually asked me while I was kind of in the middle of my quiet time. And where I was actually at in that moment was just focusing on the truth. Okay, so the truth never changes. So if I have a balloon in my hand and it's a red balloon... And most of us learned our colors in kindergarten, and we know that it's a red balloon, but then Darren comes up to me and he says, no, that balloon's green, because he had been taught that that balloon, that color was green, and I go, nope, it's red, it's red across the rest of the United States. And then Michael comes up and he says, no, 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 that's a purple balloon. And I said, no, it's red, it is a red balloon, as sure as Megan's hair is red. It is a red balloon. And then and then Darren says to me, well, why are you so close-minded? Why can't this be a green balloon? I said, well, because it is a red balloon. And then, and then Michael says to me, well, you're just, you know, close-minded, and you won't let anybody else have their own opinion, and I think it's purple. Well, you have the right to think it's purple, but the truth of the matter is it's red. Right. So when I was thinking about the truth, not a truth, but the truth, you can't help but share it, man. Come on. When you know the truth, you can't help but share it. So that's what bursts that quote for today. Um, <clears throat> so I want to read. We've actually talked about this woman before. Um, it's been some time ago, maybe a year ago. Oh, commercial. Ladies, all the ladies in the audience, you need to get one of these little flyers before you leave, this Love Like Jesus flyer, our annual women's event is going to be next Friday, a week from yesterday. And for those that aren't going to travel all the way to Kaleo on their own, be here at 4.30, and I need to know you're going to be here. And then if you say you're going to be here, you need to show up because I need to be sure I have enough spaces to transport from here to Kaleo and then back to here when the event is done. It is going to be so much fun. The ladies' event, it's our sixth annual ladies' event. We have a really fancy dinner, and you can get your hair did, and your nails did, and you can make crafts, and you can get your makeup done, and we're going to have gifts, and um, just some testimony time, and just a whole, 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 whole lot of fun. You won't want to miss it. If you miss it, and you hear everybody talking about it, you got to wait till next year to enjoy it. So, that was a commercial. It was brought to you by Holy Spirit. All right. Something number three. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be in the book of John, and we're going to be in the chapter of four, and like I said, we have talked about this woman before, but she just really gets me going, okay? I'm just telling you. She um, is actually the very first evangelist and the spreader of the good, spreader, is that the word? The spreader of good news. She was the first evangelist to go out and say, I have found the Messiah. Now, they were all looking for him because they knew the timing was right because of the stars, and they'd been watching for him, and she was the first one. I think it's ironic it was a woman, but don't get me started. So, John 4. Um, We'll just start in, well, verse 1. The news quickly reached the Jewish religious leaders known as the Pharisees that Jesus was drawing greater crowds of followers coming to be baptized than John, although Jesus himself didn't baptize, but only his disciples. Jesus heard what was being said and abruptly left Judea, returned to the province of Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now I'm going to tell you this, he didn't have to pass through Samaria. He chose to pass through Samaria. Because any Jew going from here to Galilee would go out of their way to not go through Samaria, and Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria, but he chose to. Starting at verse 5. Jesus arrived at the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Wearied by his long journey, he sat on the edge of Jacob's well and sent his disciples into the village to buy food, for it was already afternoon. Soon, 
a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. She replied, Why would a Jewish man ask a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritan. Strictly taboo. Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And certainly men didn't have anything to do with women. Women were in a different place in time there. Jesus came and set all that straight. I appreciate him for that. But let me give you a little bit of uh, knowledge about this woman here. Well, she's not named. You know, I think we've talked for the past two weeks about unnamed women in the Bible. We had the woman that was bent over, who had been bent over for 18 years. Then we talked about the woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. Both of them healed, delivered, sanctified, made safe and sound and whole by him. But now we're looking at another woman who I personally can relate with. This woman was at the watering hole at noon. Now y'all know in Texas summers that you don't do much in the heat of the day. You do all your running around in the morning or all your running around late in the evening because what's wrong with Texas in the heat of the day? It's hot! It's a practice for hell, I'm just telling y'all. If you don't like it then, don't go there. Okay, so she is at the well at noon because she had a problem or they had a problem, the other women, with her. The women would come to the well early in the day, and it was like g gathering, you know, at a quilting bee or at the at the fence so that they could say what all's going on in the town around them and blah, blah, blah. And so here is this woman at the well at noon because her identity was shame. Did y'all catch that? She was at the well at noon because her identity was shame. So the woman replied, no. Jesus replied, if you only knew who I am and the gift that God wants to give you. Okay, not only do Jews not talk to Samaritans, not only do men not talk to women, they darn sure don't give gifts to women. But as we know, Jesus came to rock things up. You'd ask me for a drink and I would give you living water. Now, I don't know if she caught that or not, because he was at a well that had been previously dug hundreds of years ago that was instrumental for the whole entire tribe of, of, of the Jews. It was a landmark. It was Jacob's well. Jacob's well meant something. It meant incredible it was a spring-fed well it always had water and now here jesus is telling her man if you knew who i was you'd be asking me and i'd give you a drink of living water now i probably would have questioned him right at that point well wait 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 what's what's living water what what does that mean so the woman replied but sir you don't even have a bucket she's still thinking physical logistics Okay, Jesus needs a drink. He asked her for a drink, and then she was like, what are you even talking to me for? And he said, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for water. And she's like, wait a minute, you don't even have a bucket. How are you going to give me living water? You don't even have a bucket, and the well is very deep, so where do you find this living water? I don't know if back then they did these little air quotes, but if they had done them, she probably would have said living water. You know what I'm saying? Can you see that? So do you really think that you are greater than our ancestor Jacob who dug this well and drank from it himself along with his children and livestock? So I'm here to tell you she was probably mocking him just a little bit. Yes? The, uh, the reason why they're in a foreign land and these familiar uh, landmarks are there is because this was once Israel. It's now called Samaria. Samaria was the name of the northernmost um, uh, capital at that time, and when the Assyrians took over, and and, and oh, I was going to go there. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds, you know. Um, so she she is at this place where he's saying, "Oh man, you'd ask me for a drink," and he said, "Oh yeah, well I'd give you living water." And now she's mocking him because she is mocking Jesus, living water. So, Jesus answered, if you drink from Jacob's well, you will be thirsty again. 
Okay, let's stop right there and go into what Darren was talking about. So, when Assyria came and, and captured the, the Jews hundreds of years before that, they conquered them in a, in a war, in a battle. Then they took the Assyrian people and brought them into this land. And not only did they bring the people into this land to intermarry with the Jews, which they weren't supposed to do, they brought their gods. Gods with a little g. And so when they brought their people into this land to intermingle with the Jews, this is hundreds of years ago, and then from there, from the Jews and the Assyrians, they got Samaritans, and from there they worshipped Yahweh and a whole bunch of gods with a little g. And that was an issue. That was a serious problem. Because I'm here to tell you that in the Old Testament, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the very first one is said, you will have no other gods before me. I'm the only one. I'm the only one that created you. I'm the only God that sustains you. I'm the only God that will deliver you. Therefore, I'm the only God that you're going to worship. And we said, oh yeah, watch this. And how did that turn out? Right? Right. We've got all kinds of gods that we worship now, even though in today in America, we don't have these little statues that in different places in the world with other religions that they worship, we worship a whole lot of gods with a little G in this country. Uh, Money and fame, yeah. prestige, relationships, status, yeah. money, music, I, I, there's a bit alcohol, drugs, okay? There's a list of names of gods that in America we worship with a little G. That's right. So Jesus answered, If you drink from Jacob's well, you will be thirsty again. But if anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never be thirsty again. For when you drink the water I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of Holy Spirit flooding you with endless life. Amen. Come on. Y'all say gushing fountain. Of Holy, of Holy Spirit giving endless life. Endless life. <sighs> Man, what else do you need besides that? Come on. I, I mean, that's that's it in a nutshell. That's it. So, really, what Jesus was saying to her is that nothing will satisfy you except me. There is no relationship. There is no drug. <laughs> there is no drink. There is no dollar bill, which won't be a dollar bill for long. There is no nothing that will satisfy you the way I do. Remember John 10, 10, when Jesus said, Man, it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you can have life and have it more abundantly. God, God doesn't want us to have a life. He wants us to have an abundant life, gushing and overflowing with Holy Spirit. So the woman replied, Let me drink. Okay, she, you hear what she's thinking? Y'all know what she's thinking? Remember, she's the woman that's shamed. She's got to go to the well at noon all by herself, and she can't be in town because people mock her, people talk about her, people whisper, people point. And she's saying, oh, if I'm never going to be thirsty, and give me this water, and I don't have to do this mess anymore. Right. We're looking for a quick fix. She wanted the quick fix to take care of her thirst, her water for cooking, her water for bathing, her water for living with water. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Let me drink that water so I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come back here to draw water because she's still thinking carnal. She is looking for the answer to her little bitty problems and he's here to give her the answer to the big problems. Amen. I mean the big problems, okay? Remember when Jesus went to the guy on the mat and he said... What do you want from me? He said, well, I'd like to walk again. He said, okay, your sins are forgiven. That's not what he asked for. He wanted to walk. Jesus said, I know the more important thing, your sins are forgiven. But just to show that I am who I say I am, get up and walk. Mm -hmm. So Jesus takes care of the big problem, the big problem that we have, and then all the little problems work themselves out. They just show up. Our sins are forgiven, and then we get to get off the mat and walk. Then we roll up the mat and we take it with us because we're never going to lay on the mat again. We take the mat and we bring it with us because we never want to forget where we came from. I remember who I was. I know my before Jesus. Y'all don't know my before Jesus. I know my before Jesus, which is why I'm so grateful for my after Jesus. Amen. So let me, we ain't even gotten there yet. The one over replied, no, I said that already. So Jesus said, go get your husband and bring him back here. He's so sneaky. Yo, he's so sneaky. 
that's, she said, but I'm not married. <laughs> Jesus said, oh yeah, that is true. For you've been married five times, and now you're living with a man who is not your husband. You have told the truth. This was not new news. Everybody in the town knew she'd had five husbands and knew she was living with someone she wasn't married to. She, he didn't have to read the National Enquirer to find that out. He didn't even have to have a word of knowledge from the father to find that out. Everybody in town knew it. Then he said to her, when you were 18 and going to a private Christian school in North Richland Hills, you fell in love with a, a musician who was a rock star. And you got pregnant, and you discovered you were pregnant at church camp when you were a just graduated high school. And he said, and that marriage didn't work out, because that's not the man I had for you. His name was Mark. He gave me three children. And then he said, and then you married your childhood sweetheart. His name was Johnny. You were only married to him for three months because you were just looking for someone to take care of you. And then Jesus said to me, then you went to the other end of the scale and you married a man 17 years older than you because you really wanted just to be taken care of because life was hard. You were raising three children on your own, but that didn't work out either because that marriage was surrounded and placed upon drinking and cocaine. And then he said, but if you wait, I'll give you a godly man that you can walk and do ministry with and serve me with. And then I knew Jesus was real. That's what happened to this woman. You're a dork. You're a dork. So the woman changed the subject. Anybody know about that? You need to talk about something important, and all of a sudden we're talking about airplanes or the color of the sky or something else. Nothing about what the subject is here. Jesus nailed her on the spot. He nailed her on the spot. He said, you are telling the truth. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not even your husband. So she says, well, how about them Yankees? <laughs> how about those cowboys? So the woman changed the subject and said, oh, you must be a prophet. So tell me this. Why do our fathers worship God on this nearby mountain, but your people, that's the Jews, teach that Jerusalem is the place where we must worship? Who is right? Now, she's pretty good because she's getting him off track of her track record but still talking about something she thinks he's going to want to talk about. Yeah. Maybe we won't go back to that subject. Yeah. So she tries to trap Jesus, change the subject, redirect the conversation. So Jesus responded, Believe me, dear woman, the time has come. <laughs> Man, those words are powerful. The time has come. When you will worship the Father, neither on a mountain nor in Jerusalem, but in your heart. Amen. She said, what? What? What are you talking about? Nothing. Nothing that the Jews did or that... Okay, so they still had some of the Jewish stuff. The Samaritans still had some Jewish knowledge in them. And none of it, the Jews or people that had Jewish knowledge, none of it was about the inside. It was all about the outside of the cup. He even told the Pharisees, Man, you clean the outside of the cup, I'm worried about the inside of the cup. You clean the inside of the cup, and the outside of the cup is going to get clean. You clean your heart, and your life will have fruit that shows it. Period. Did y'all get that? Yeah. It's inside the heart that it matters. So you people don't really know the one you worship, but we Jews out of our experience for it's the Jews that salvation is available but from now on worshiping the Father will not be a matter of the right place but with a right heart yeah we're not in the building right. we don't have a steeple on the top of our yeah. canopy we're, we don't have real pews we don't have a real choir we have an amazing band thank you thank you band thank you thank you thank you <laughs> But we're not a normal church. But it doesn't matter. Because we're here with a real heart, right. y'all. Right. Even if you didn't come here today with a real heart, you're going to talk to somebody that has a real heart. And my prayer is that their 
real heart will rub off on your heart that needs to become real and in love with Jesus Christ. Period. That's the way it is. It is a heart issue. Anytime you have an issue in life and you understand why you got where you're at, it's not a sin problem. It's a presence problem. It's a presence problem of the Lord in your life, in your heart. Amen. For God is a spirit and he longs to have sincere worshipers who adore him in the realm of the spirit and in truth. Now if you're reading in ESB, it says God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So she had some of the Jewish knowledge and she says, this is all so confusing. I do know that the anointed one is coming, the true Messiah. And when he comes, he will tell us everything we need to know. Hello? He just did. She was missing it. Now she's not going to miss it for very long, y'all. Hold on, it's coming. But she was missing it at the moment. So Jesus said to her, you don't have to wait any longer. The anointed one is here speaking with you. I am the one you're looking for. I am. I am. Moses said to who? Who will I tell Pharaoh is sending me? He said, I am. I am. That holds power. When we, Jesus is the name that's above every name. We pray for healing. We cast out demons. We raise the dead. We do. We move mountains with a grain of mustard seed because of who Jesus Christ is and because of his name. At the end, y'all, everyone will bow a knee yeah. to his name. Right. And if necessary, the rocks will cry out. I um, was doing some, you know, different research. That's Darren and I had talked quite a bit of, about just some different little aspects on this. One of these notes that's here says she had five husbands and she was living with a sixth man. So every one of us has married five husbands in some aspect. We have gone into a covenant relationship with someone or something that wasn't God or who God intended for us. And then the sixth one, that's the number of man, y'all. We have gone into an idolatrous relationship with ourselves as Lord of our lives. And how did that turn out for you? <laughs> I'm telling you, dude, I, for me, it turned out bad. Uh -huh. When I started listening to the Lord, my life began to change. Yeah. So, our heart can never be satisfied with what is on this earth. We must drink the living water that comes from heaven. Christ is our seventh husband the only one who satisfies. Christ is the real husband. He's called the bridegroom. Yes. John calls him the bridegroom first. That's the first time he's ever been called the bridegroom. And then we see it in the end. When he is coming back, y'all, Jesus came once. He's coming twice. Yes. And he's coming back again. And he's coming back for a pickup date for a wedding. And he's coming to get his bride. And she is supposed to, she is supposed to have herself ready. We're not waiting for somebody else to get us clean. We're not waiting for somebody else to take care of business. We're not waiting for just the right moment when we can all of a sudden do things right. She, we, are supposed to be getting ourselves dressed for a wedding. Because Amen. Jesus is coming back. Woo! Amen. So at that moment, his disciples return. Now this girl is like, what? <laughs> This is the first person that Jesus has revealed himself to publicly. That he is, he is the one who said straight up, I am the Messiah. So at the moment his disciples returned and they were stunned to see Jesus speaking with a Samaritan woman. Yet none of them dared to ask him why or what they were discussing. <laughs> All at once, y'all. That's that immediately word. Remember, Jesus said to, to the Peter and James and John and Andrew, follow me, and immediately they left everything they belonged to follow him. When Philip became saved and knew who Jesus was, and he went to Nathaniel, Nathaniel was like, oh my goodness, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. This can't be the real Messiah. He said, just come and see. I'm asking y'all today, come and see. Come and see who I'm talking about that dwells within me, Holy Spirit, because Jesus sits on the throne. Jesus sits on the mercy seat next to the Father. So all at once, or immediately, 
the woman left her water jar and ran off to her village and told everyone. Here's what she did. She was like, when she had the understanding now of what Jesus was talking about, the living water, and he's going to talk about being the bread of life in just a second, and he is talking about, I am the one people are waiting for, then she's like, oh my goodness. Y'all with me? Oh my goodness. Once you know the truth, you can't help but share Jesus. The truth, the real truth, not adulterated truth, not partial truth, not watered down truth, the real truth. And she was like, oh my goodness. And she left everything that she had. She forgot she'd gone to get water, y'all. She needed water. She forgot it. Because she came and met the living water. And then she went running into town and said, come, be a man who's told me everything I have ever done. And they were like, we all know what you've done. <laughs> Everybody knew what she had done. She goes, no, it's not like that. Call me the man that has told me everything I have done. So they said, okay, well, let's go check it out. Then they went, and they met him. And then they knew. She knew what she was talking about. He had come to give her a new identity. They met him. They loved him. They saw him for who he was. And they knew that he was the Messiah and he was going to change their life. So I'm asking you to come and see and meet the Messiah so that your life can be changed. I know you don't like the season you may be in. I didn't like the season when I was where you were. There are days I got a roof and there are days I don't like the season I'm in. But I hold on because I know that with every mountaintop there is a valley before it and there is a valley after it. Because James 1 tells me that I counted all joy in those valleys. I counted all joy when, not if, when I face trials of all different kinds. Because I'm either going into a trial, I'm in a trial, or I'm coming out of a trial. There's seasons, they're over. But if we hold on to the robe, if we hold on, if we just hold on to Jesus, He will carry us through because He's the Good Shepherd. John 10. He is the Good Shepherd. And He is the Shepherd that leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. He is with us in every a pit, pitiful situation that we come to. Generally, we're there because of mistakes that we made. He doesn't care. He still, well, all we have to do is say, Jesus, come. Come to me. Come to me. Help me. I want to be saved. I don't want to be an orphan anymore. I want to be a daughter. I'm a daughter. I am a daughter, and nothing will change that. Because he took me from being an orphan, and he adopted me into the kingdom, and all of a sudden, what belonged to Jesus now belongs to me too, y'all. Even the authority and power he's given us to heal the sick, so the deaf can hear, so the blind can see. But way more than that, so the dead can live. Y'all get this? He didn't come to make good people, bad people good. This is kind of a saying going on, going around right now. He didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Yeah. You may be sitting here breathing right now, but if you haven't been born again, born in the Spirit, then you are dead because God is Spirit. Yeah. And we worship Him in Spirit and truth. Because He tells us in John 3 that we have to be born of the flesh, which all of us sitting here are, then we have to be born of the Spirit. And only those born of the Spirit are the ones that are going to make it to the other side of time to be with the Father. Yeah. They're the only ones that are coming into the family reunion because they're the only ones that are family. So if you've been born once, you're going to die twice. If you've been born twice, you're going to die once. That's the end of it. That's the end. That's it in a nutshell. The gospel's very simple. Jesus saw that we were lost orphans. He came and he did something about it. For eternity, he did something about it. And he's offering to us the gift to be adopted. Now, I don't know if any of you in here have been, but I've been adopted. Like, on earth, and like, this person, this me. Not, sp <laughs> not spiritually, but physically. Physically, I have been adopted. I know what it's like to live with adopted parents. I know what it's like to be rescued from a situation and put into a situation that gave me the life that I had. I know what it's like to be spiritually poor, spiritually drained, spiritually dead, and come to Jesus to be born again and now be spiritually alive so that I can go around and tell folks, come, me a man who has told me everything that I have done. Y'all, that's it. I mean, I missed one of the guys in that little scenario right there. 
I lived with a man, my children would have told you way back in the day, she would have been married to Mike, but he was already married to somebody else. Okay? All that's before Jesus. Yeah. When Jesus adopted me into the kingdom, all that stuff went away. Mark. That stuff is not who I am. I am not my sins. I am not my addictions. I'm not who I was. I am right now the daughter to the King of Kings, and my inheritance is what belongs to Jesus, belongs to me. Yeah. You with me? Yeah. Woo! Who wouldn't want that? Right. It's not about, well, then I can't get high anymore. <laughs> I don't care if you get high. You come to Jesus, and you and him will work out your business later on. You with me? Yeah. I heard a guy, um, it was on a TikTok, and Darren was listening to it, and I caught it because it, it caught my attention, and I asked him to send it to me, and I should have listened to it again, but I forgot. Huh. And he, this guy asked the preacher, well, if I, if, I, if I surrender my life to Jesus, can I still get high? He said, sure. He said, are you sure I can still get high if I surrender my life to Jesus? He says, heck yeah. And he pulls this big old blunt out from his jacket, and he said, okay. And he said, so this is all right? And he said, oh, you surrender your life to Jesus, and you two will work out the details later. Okay? I got clean and sober and thought it was still okay to smoke pot for a season. For a long time. I thought it was still okay to smoke pot. And then as he cleaned me up, the psalmist says that he reached down in the slimy pit, and he picked me up, and he set me on solid ground, and he cleaned me off brand new. And as I went through that process, I discovered that Jesus never tried to sin and get away with it. Why would I? There is not anything I want to engage in that's going to open a portal, not only to my old life, but to any demonic presence that thinks they have authority in my life. Because the only person that has authority in my life is Jesus Christ. Period. There is no other authority in my life. Are y'all with me? Yeah. So when I surrendered these things to him, he took them away from me. It says that he cast our sins as far as the east is, from the west, he throws them into the sea of forgetfulness, and he chooses to remember them no more. Amen. He can remember them. He's God. But he chooses not to remember them. Because remember, Satan knows your name but calls you by your sin. That's right. God knows your sin but calls you by your name. Amen. There's a difference. The adulterated kingdom and the righteous kingdom. And I'm asking you guys to come and see the man who told me everything about my life and then set me free. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you that your word changes life. I thank you that your word brings life. I thank you that your word brings hope. I thank you that your word frees us, delivers us, makes us safe and sound, makes us whole, makes us your kid, puts us on the roster of kingdom, and now you're our daddy, and we have every right to step into the throne room boldly and talk with you. Like this Samaritan woman who wanted to argue with Jesus, you're okay with that. We can come to you with questions, and you always have answers. Help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see, and a mind that's open to receive, and a heart that's willing to be replaced. A heart of stone that's willing to be replaced for a heart of flesh that is hardwired with the DNA of Jesus Christ. Because I'm no longer a slave to sin and death. I'm a bondservant to the King of Kings. I don't have to live for you. I choose to live for you. I don't have to do the right thing. I choose to do the right thing. And the blessings that come from it are what bring you glory. Doing the right thing grows fruit in our lives so that we can say to others, come and see, come and meet a man that I have met that's told me everything about myself and he loves me anyways. That's a big one, y'all. You're so good to us, Father. We don't deserve your forgiveness. We don't deserve your grace and mercy. But you pour it, you lavish it on us because of how much you love us. Because you counted us worthy of the cost of the Son of Man, Son of God. Jesus, I praise you and thank you for the price that you paid. That what you went through when you hung on the cross as me, not for me, and you became all my sin and all my junk 
and all my worst days and the deepest, lowest part of me. You said it's worth it. I thank you for loving us that much. And Holy Spirit, as you dwell on earth with us as an agent of God here with us and you dwell inside of us and you live inside of us as you direct us to show us what it's like to be ambassadors for the kingdom, to carry our head up high because you've called us sin and daughter no matter what's in our past. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you direct us and that you guide us and you protect us and you discipline us, which teaches us, which <laughs> trains us. We are just, I am humbled. I am humbled every day. More and more every day. Every day I'm humbled more today than I was yesterday to be called your kid. I thank you so much for it. And thank you for the amazing food you've given us today. And the needs list. And just all that you do for us. That you've gone before us to prepare a way. And you are behind us and beside us to protect us. Help us to walk in the right image. In the spirit image of you, Father. I praise you. I thank you. I adore you. I bless you. I honor you. I bow before you. Mighty are you. I pray all this. In the name that's above every name. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Because he's coming back. Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, 